neighbors were continually celebrating the various gods who were popular in the region, as well as the imperial gods of Rome, and on occasion even the emperor himself. Symbols of the various deities would be all around them. One of the major issues for somebody like John seems not to be the fact that they are suffering persecution, but the fact that they've just become too comfortable. They've settled down. They've found their place in society. And he's wanted to shake them up a bit. If John was writing to those Christians who had begun to worship Rome's emperors, it would help explain why the last book of the Bible was written. The visions were less about prophesying the future and more about chastising those who had joined the imperial cult. But there is something left unanswered. The vivid apocalyptic images which have captured the imagination of millions of Christians for centuries. What possible meaning could these visions have had for John's churches? Maybe they had little to do with the cult of the divine emperor and everything to do with the visions of a terrifying future. To those who lived 2,000 years ago, John's visions of the four horsemen, Armageddon and the beast, may have held entirely different meanings than today. Some see them now as signs for the end of the world, but that's not necessarily what John meant. The word apocalyptic had a different emphasis then. Many people, when they hear the word apocalyptic, think about the end of the world. But that's only part of this great tradition. In fact, there had been other apocalypses or revelations written in the previous 200 years. The key feature of apocalyptic literature is that it claims to reveal God's will directly. It's a message that no ordinary mortal would have access to. They're all stories. A single human visionary has this dramatic revelatory experience, and he requires the assistance of a heavenly being to explain what he's seeing and experiencing. So the apocalypse is unfold as stories describing these experiences. Apocalypses promise their readers an escape from the harsh reality of everyday life. For first century Christians, John's writings offer a world where their faith triumphs. They promise their audience God's world. It's either in the heavenly realms or it's coming in the future. And it's a world where the faithful will be rewarded for their faithfulness and where justice will prevail and where wickedness will be judged. John was in good company. Some scholars believe that Jesus himself was deeply influenced by apocalyptic literature. One of the most famous prayers in the world seems to share the same themes as the book of Revelation. When the disciples of Jesus ask him to teach them how to pray, then uh, Jesus teaches them to say the Lord's Prayer. And that prayer can be read apocalyptically. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That implies that the kingdom of God has not yet come to earth, that the will of God is not being done on earth. So that's like the book of Revelation seeing God and Christ exalted in heaven. And the Lord's Prayer may even have a beast of its own. As God's kingdom began to come, then the powers of evil would do their uttermost to battle against it. Uh, so you have beasts, you have the devil at work. Uh, and that's probably what is meant at the end of the Lord's Prayer. Um, lead us not into the, the trial, but deliver us from evil, or probably deliver us from the evil one, deliver us from the power of Satan. If Jesus used apocalyptic imagery, why not his follower, John? Perhaps this tradition of apocalyptic writing 
can help decipher some of John's visions, like the infamous Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. These terrifying beings appear first in a text from the Old Testament, the book of the prophet Zechariah. But John didn't just copy these images. His genius lay in updating them for the first century. In Zechariah, each horse is linked with a particular color. John takes this idea, but gives it a new twist. His first century audience would probably have understood the meaning of the colors. Ian Boxall believes he can crack John's code. John seems to make the significance of the colors more explicit. You have a red horse, red, the color of blood, and according to tradition, the color of a kind of idolatrous luxury which has brought Rome its current dominance, but at the expense of so much blood being shed. The rider on the black horse seems to symbolize famine and disaster, the aftermath of war. Then there is a pale or green horse, the sickly color of death itself. <laughs> but one horseman described by John, the rider on the white horse has a bow in his hand. This suggests vengeance is on John's mind and he believes it will come at the hand of Rome's sworn enemy. Now, your average Christian would know that the great enemy of Rome, the great threat to Rome on the east, the Parthian Empire, had a cavalry which carried bows. The Parthians are on their way, and the ultimate effect of this will be the destruction of this apparently impregnable empire. So even the vision of the four horsemen is part of John's encouragement to the Christian church that the empire's days were numbered. But the four horsemen are not the only apocalyptic images in the book. Just as famous is Armageddon, the battlefield where Revelation says the forces of good and evil will wage war. Archaeological evidence shows that this image, too, is meant to evoke hatred of the Romans. This is Megiddo, in the Jezreel Valley in modern-day Israel. Archaeologists believe that its name holds a clue to the site of Armageddon. In Hebrew, the site of Megiddo is actually Har Megiddo, the mountain of Megiddo. And we go from Har Megiddo to Armageddon, to Armageddon. And indeed, in some of the earliest versions of the New Testament, written in Greek, Armageddon has an aspirant at the beginning, meaning it's pronounced with an H. So it originally was Armageddon, and you can get from Armageddon to Armageddon very easily. This tranquil site seems an unlikely place for John to choose as the location for the battle at the end of the world. But in fact, it was entirely appropriate. The Jezreel Valley would have been the bloodiest place in Palestine that John knew about. At the time that John is writing in the first century AD, there had already been 12 or 13 battles fought, either at Megiddo or in the Jezreel Valley itself. Napoleon supposedly said, there is no more perfect battleground in the world than this. And looking over the Jezreel Valley, I have no trouble believing that. Archaeologists believe there's also a very practical reason why John chose Megiddo as his battle site. In his time, it was the base for one of the most brutal armies in the eastern Mediterranean, the Roman Sixth Legion. We know that the Romans located their camp here, the camp for the uh, Sixth Legion. 
They were continuing the, the job that ancient Megiddo always